it is very easy to create unexpected behavior using pet finets. In this clip I want to explain a root cause of this problem and discuss several pet finet classes that mitigate this. To start, consider this pet finet on the left. What is its reachability graph? Of course, the start is very simple. As there are no tokens, the initial state is the empty marking and we can model it like this. But now we need to answer the question, is transition A enabled? For this, each input place needs a token. So formally, for all places, the weight function of that place with transition A should yield a smaller value or an equal value than in the current marking. Notice that the weight function returns zero for all places as A has no input places. Hence, this formula is trivially satisfied and thus the transition is enabled in any marking. So transition A is enabled and I can fire it. Firing gives us a single token in place P, which we can draw in the LTS on the right. But now transition A is enabled again as it has sufficient tokens in all its input places, like before. Hence we can fire it again, resulting in a second token in place P. And I can draw it in the LTS like this. Now transition A is enabled again, so I can fire it again, and again, and again. So this yields an infinite sequence in my reachability graph. And even worse, I need an infinite number of states to model this. Therefore, we say that patternets are more powerful than labeled transition systems. Hence, we need to be very careful in modeling. For this, I want to introduce several classes of patternets. A first class are state machine patternets, also called SNets. In a state machine, every transition has exactly one input and one output place, which we denote as follows. And the dot notation in this formula gives the nodes that are directly before the node, which we call the preset, or directly after a node, called the postset. So in this example, transition A over here does not qualify as it has two input arcs and two output arcs, which are not allowed. So if we remove those, we have a state machine. State machines have some nice properties, and I want to mention two of them. First of all, the number of tokens remains the same in every marking. So that means that you count the number of tokens in the initial marking, and then you can check in each every mark, each other marking, whether their number of tokens is exactly the same as in the initial marking. So this helps in checking your reachability graph. And even better, if the net starts with one token, the reachability graph is the same as the net itself. The second class I want to introduce are Mart graph Petri nets, also called T nets. They are the dual of state machines. So instead of requiring each transition to have exactly one input and one output place, we do this for places. So each place has exactly one input and one output transition, like this. So in the net on the left, this place does not qualify as it has multiple input and outputs. So if we remove those, this is a perfectly fine Mart graph. Also, my graphs have some nice properties, though a bit more difficult. So, for example, if all circuits are marked, all transitions can always eventually fire. So, what do we mean with this? So, look on the net, net on the left. Here we have two circuits, namely from A to B to D back to the initial, and from A to C to D back to the initial. And those two are the only circuits in this net. And as both have a, mark, have a marked place, namely this place in both circuits, we know that transitions A, B, C, and D can always eventually fire. So they should all occur in the reachability graph. The second property is that if all places are contained in a circuit, the reachability graph is finite. So in this case, all places are covered by, one by at least one circuit, and hence the reachability graph is finite. But mark graphs are a bit more difficult, so there's also a warning to this net, because cycles quickly lead to infinite reachability graphs. To give an example, consider this net. It is a mark graph, as each place has one input and one output place. There are two circuits, one with places P and Q, and one with places R and S. As both circuits are marked, all transitions can always eventually fire. However, place B cannot be contained in a circuit, and hence the reachability graph of this net is infinite. And we call the first circuit with transitions U and T a generator, as it produces an infinite number of tokens in place B. The first class I want to discuss with you are free choice petri nets, or FC nets. 
This is a bit more difficult class. It requires that if two transitions share an input place, they should share all input places, which we write formally like this. So what does it mean? Consider the net on the left. Transitions A and B share a single place. To guide the firing of transition A, I could add a pl place like this. And now I can control when transition A is enabled by adding a token here. The free choice property now requires that transition B has this place as input as well. In other words, the choice between firing transition A or transition B should not be hampered by other tokens, hence the name free choice. So note that every SNet is a free choice net and every mark graph is also a free choice net. Furthermore, you can use the structure of this net to decide which transitions are enabled. This class of net has beautiful mathematical properties, for which I refer to the 1995 book of Jörg Dezel and Javier Esparza. A completely different class of nets are the Jackson nets. These nets are defined using six construction rules. The first rule is transition expansion. Consider transition A. What the rule states is that we can split the transition into two parts the consumption of the tokens and the production of the tokens. So we have one transition for the consumption, AS, and one for the production, AT, which we connect with a place that we call A. So you could also read this as, I start with A, I am working on A, and I'm finished with A. The second rule is similar as the previous, but then for places. So we cut the place into two parts and place a transition in between. So in a similar way, you can read this as, I have tokens received, place P1, I inspect the token, transition TP, and I release the token, place P2. The third rule states you can copy a transition. You take the transition and create an exact copy, so it has the same input and output places like here. This step introduces choice. And we have a similar rule for places. We duplicate the place so that the two places have the same input and output transitions, like here. Instead of introducing choice, this step introduces concurrency. The fifth rule introduces repetition to the net. So any place may be extended by a self-loop transition. This transition does not add any state to the rigidity graph, just a self-loop transition. However, we can then further extend this transition using the other rules, thus introducing repetitive behavior. And the last rule is similar to the previous, but then adding a place. Note that we mark the place, as otherwise the transition is, not an, is never enabled. We typically use this rule to add resources or a critical section. So why do we have this net? Because there's this an important property that we use often. If the net reduces to a single marked place, like here, the reachability graph is always finite. So that means that if you take a, a random net, you apply those rules to make it smaller, and if you end up with a single place that is marked, then the reachability graph is finite, and you know that it has all the nice properties. A special class of pattern nets are workflow nets. A workflow net represents a business process in terms of a pattern net. There's a clear start, the initial place, that is the only place that has no input arcs, so no transition can produce tokens in that place. Therefore, we initially mark it with a single token, it is the start of the process. A process also has a clear goal, in Petrinet terms, that is a final place, which is the only place that has no output arcs, so no transition can consume from that place. It resembles the goal of the process. If we produce a token in that place, the process should be finished. And third, all transitions should contribute reaching the goal, hence all nodes have to be on a path from the initial place to the final place. An important property for workflow nets is soundness. Soundness consists of three sub-properties. First, we have weak termination. A process has a clear goal. In terms of pattern nets, this is the final place. So reaching the goal is represented in the pattern net with a single token in the final place. Now, weak termination expresses that wherever you are in executing the net, you should always be able to reach this final marking, formally captured in this formula. Proper completion is the second property. It states that as soon as you reach your goal, thus having a token in place F, there should be no work left. In Petrinet terms, once you mark the final place F, all other places should be empty. 
And last, we want that all transitions occur in the reachability graph. And this signifies that all transitions can contribute to achieving the goal. So this has a nice property. If the workflow net is sound, then the reachability graph is finite. So let's consider an example. Is this net a workflow net? Well, it has an initial place i and a final place f. All transitions are on a path and there's one token in place i. So yes, this is a workflow net. Is it also sound? For this, I play the token game. So transition A is enabled. It fires, which results in a token in place P. Now transition B is enabled, which produces a token in place Q. And now C is enabled. I know that I can continue this game, but I can never get a token in both Q and R. Hence transition D is never enabled, and thus the workflow net is not sound. So let's quickly change this and add a 2 on the, on the arc between transition A and place P. So is it a workflow net? Well, yes, it's the same net as before. And now is it a sound workflow net? I play the token game again. Transition A is enabled. Firing net results two tokens in place P. So now I can fire transition B, leaving a token in P and one in Q. So that means that transitions B and C are enabled. So now I fire transition C. So it consumes the token in place Q and produces a token in place R. Now transitions E and B are enabled. Firing transition E would lead to a, a marking in which there are two tokens in place P, which I already had. So I fire transition B, consuming the token from place P, producing one in place Q. So I have now tokens in places Q and R. That means the transitions C, D and E are all enabled. So I can fire transition D, and it results in one token in place F. So it is sound. Now consider this net. Instead of having one transition D, I now have a transition D and E. Is it a workflow net? Well, yes, everything is still on a path. Is it sound? Well, let's play the token game. So I fire transition A, gives me two tokens in place P. I can fire transition B, which gives me one token in place Q and one in place P. And I can fire transition D, which gives me one token in place P and one, in token, uh, one token in place F. But now proper completion does not hold, because I have a token in pl both place P and F, which is more than just an F. Hence, the workflow net is not sound. Soundness also has some nice properties. For example, if the workflow net is a state machine, we know it is sound. And also, if the workflow net is an acyclic mark graph, it is sound as well. And last, if you can use the Jackson nets to reduce the workflow net to a single marked place, you know it is sound. So to conclude, we've seen different classes of nets that have finite reachability graphs, namely state machine, petri nets, and Jackson nets. We've also seen structured classes of nets with nice properties, mark graph petri nets and free choice petri nets. And there's a special class called workflow nets that we use a lot in business process modeling. So use these properties while modeling. Take your advantage of them. Good luck modeling.